Shamriti, can you hear us? Shamriti is also in the attendee list, actually. She is not in the panelist. Okay. Shamriti, please accept the invitation. Shamriti, please accept the invitation and... Uh... Good morning, sir. Good morning. There's a little bit of technical difficulty. Uh, good morning, please, sir. Prem, Shamriti said, uh, good morning, sir. Uh, good morning. Sir, Shamriti, uh, Prem, Shamriti cannot see the option of uh, accepting that. I think it's in the mode, right? Sir, I have, yes, sir. I have given, sir. So, Shamriti, you have to give me a phone. You have to give me a phone. Okay. Uh, okay. Prem Kumar, can you guide step by step? Uh, ask them to which sir, button to press and all good. that. Somebody did that. Please, uh, please click on yes. We are sending one request from here to join as panelist. You no, have to click on yes. Is not seeing the request at all. Where is he going to see the request? Help her understand. In this, in this platform, sir, only. Where, just you are. Just you should yes click. Zoom window. Zoom window. Zoom window. Zoom window. Zoom window. Zoom window. Okay. Shamriti, unmute. Sir, am I audible? Yes, yes. you are. Yes. yes sir. Please sorry, proceed, sorry, please. Sir. Sorry, sir, for the delay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I am Shamriti Dash, a student of MSc second year, Department of Applied Chemistry, Macau, West Bengal. I am one of the coordinators of this program with the tagline of the students, for the students, by the students on the topic. However, the majority of the presentation of today's symposium is in the domain of applied chemistry for its applications. This is a combined effort of first year and second year students of our department of applied chemistry. This program is divided into two technical sessions in addition to the inaugural session. In the first technical session, we will have 11 oral presentations. And in the second technical session, we will have 12 poster presentations. I am happy to share that we will have two external oral presentations of our fellow batchmates from Calcutta University and Sister Nivedita University. Now, on behalf of the organizing committee of this student symposium, a very warm welcome to all the esteemed panelists and participants in this inaugural session of this webinar. I am thankful to the all attendees who, who have registered for this webinar and for their precious time to join this inaugural session. In today's symposium, the speakers will discuss some interesting aspects of applied chemistry and how applied chemistry matters today and for a better tomorrow. Before proceeding further, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce today's panel members in this inaugural session. We have our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Sir, Professor Dr. Shoykot Moitro. We have Professor Dr. Shukhendu Shamajdar, Director of the School of Applied Science and Technology. We have with us Dr. Tapos Ghosh, the HOD of our Department of Applied Chemistry, Professor Dr. Shubhas Chandra Bhattacharya, Dr. Orijit Bag, and Dr. Devasri Manna. Uh, we are also thankful to the other dignitaries, HODs, and faculty members of other departments of our university who have taken their precious time in this inaugural session. Professor Dr. Radhavallo Bhor, HOD of the Department of Applied Physics, Applied Mathematics, and Applied Statistics, was also about to join us in this symposium, but due to some problems, he couldn't make, he couldn't make it, and he already conveyed it to us. I am also thankful. I am also thankful to the participants from Calcutta University and Sister Nivedita University who will deliver their oral presentation in this webinar. So with this 
brief introduction of the panelist may I now request our honorable vice chancellor to kindly inaugurate the session and deliver his inaugural speech over to you, sir thank you samriddhi good morning to all my co panelist dr samajdar uh, professor subhash bhattacharya dr tapos ghosh dr urjit bag and uh, other uh, the students panelist who will be presenting their deliberation at today's program indeed it's a great endeavor from the department of applied chemistry of our university to start a session of this type of this nature i was continuously you know, advising to all the departmental heads and coordinators to involve the students in this types of knowledge exercise and i am very happy to see that department of applied chemistry it uh, is sincerely and seriously trying to integrate the students in all these exercises pertaining to the development of knowledge now the thing is this is uh, applied chemistry as a subject is of tremendous importance for the growth and development of economy of any country in india it is of no exception and if we look at the history it our bengal uh, academician like dr prafulla chandra ray he demonstrated how academic knowledge can be transferred in setting up a uh, corporation of national importance and uh, that was the one of the remarkable success story at that point of time as far as the indian industries the setting up of indian industries by a native indian basically from academic background is concerned and afterwards there was a lots of uh, in, uh, involvement from doins of other fields also in promoting chemical and applied chemistry based industries in this place of uh, india in bengal dr nilotan sarkar and others they came forward in setting up in supporting you know, this uh, this uh, tannery basically that involves a lot of chemical processes bengal potteries bengal enamels so the list is uh, uh, endless but however for some other reasons certain some technical some non technicals most of these industries uh, chemical industries they shifted their base from eastern part of india to western part and uh, all these pharmaceuticals fertilizers you know, this uh, glass and ceramics and and uh, drug these uh, basic, uh, basic chemicals all these all phases, this uh, uh, product based industries they uh, once upon a time that were proliferated at bengal but now uh, we can see that other parts of india now they are doing all these activities but the time has come history always says that it is a it is a question of it is a matter of swing sometimes at one point of time the pendulum swings from one side to another side and at other point of time it swings back so now the time has come to enrich the economy of bengal by our knowledge exercises encouraging our students community in taking up entrepreneurial activities startups and innovative activities in bringing back the previous glory of applied chemistry and chemical based industries at this part of the country and this is a uh, this is not a formidable challenge because the fact that the situation has changed time has changed earlier we uh, had a strong reliance on chemical based process industries now the worldwide the perception is changing towards the use of green chemicals towards the protection of environment towards the use of uh, processes which are eco friendly and there we can uh, have a, you know this advantage if we uh, take up all these exercises at the very beginning and there are abundance of resources at this part of bengal at this eastern part in in, in that india this there is abundance abundance of resources but as we are a university at this side and we want our students they will do something for the uh, betterment of the economy of the state so and by up and at large for the country as well so my advice is now look in and around and try to identify where the problem is existing where the pain is existing so there are abundance of scopes fountains of opportunities i can tell you if you can apply your mind innovative mind you will find that there is tremendous scope of doing something which is good and great and uh, 
this this is to be this culture is to be inculcated amongst all of us uh, orthodox way of doing some things traditional way of doing some things mundane way of doing some things as per completion of an university degree getting some degrees and doing some you know the set piece of jobs uh, traditional jobs this situation has changed we have to survive by sheer grit and determination for applications of our innovative faculties this See the next decade, this decade itself, in the next few, in the next few years, we'll be seeing human species. They are surviving based on their intelligence, and that intelligence is basically related to innovation. And this is now this uh, this situation is now you know this uh, conducive enough or prolific enough uh, for our student vendor, student faculty members to get encouraged for doing something out of the box. And you see, I want that, uh, that is my vision and dream that our students member, they will take up the challenge of mitigating the problems related to plastic pollution, problem related to drinking water quality improvement, problem related to mitigation of sports scarcity, problem related to uh, uh, use of you know, this uh, uh, eco-friendly or environment friendly pesticides and fertilizers for, uh, for the support of agricultural communities, problems related to to affordability of uh, drugs and medicine uh, to the course of populations in, uh, in this country. So these problems, if the list is enormous. So take up this challenge, do something of your own, try to, you see, the room was not built in a day. So within, uh, immediately by tomorrow, you will be doing something novel and miracle that you do not expect. But slowly, step by step, getting in sports, getting information, building your strength, Developing your community, doing something you know, is, is not a difficult task. And we are supporting these sorts of endeavor from our university. If you come forward with certain novel idea, after carefully selecting different, you know, these inputs uh, from this uh, from the surroundings and, and validating that by your departmental faculty members and heads, we are here to support your endeavors initially with uh, within our resources, within our limited strength, and and that that we want that we are within the uh, uh, within a couple of years, a few years, we want that uh, numbers of startups are coming at, at, uh, from this university are, are being developed at this university. We know that startup success is rate is also limited, but still we have to start. We have to start. Of doing something and if you can do something great you can say that in near future maybe after a few decades you will not be considered as one of the uh, as one of the path breaker or one of the pioneers in turning around the entire scenario of this of the state as far as the prosperity is concerned based on this chemical and applied chemistry based industries so with this my Best wishes to all of you. Be inspired. This is a very, very fascinating subject. Lots of things can be done and try to develop your community. I'm very happy to know that students from other universities are coming forward to take part at today's program. Now, this, this is what we are looking for. We have to develop our own community. We have to integrate with other universities, other institutes. And because alone, we cannot do anything. We cannot do nothing. We can do nothing. We have to rely on the strength and you know this um, uh, uh, strength of others, opportunities existing elsewhere. So, and that is possible if we have a mindset, open mindset in embracing all these things, all these new things, novel things. If we, if we, if we uh, open enough to admit our our weakness, and if we continuously, relentlessly work on to build up our own strength. So. I believe that we are all in the right track, right path. And I hope that in the near future, you will bring glory to this university, to this department, to this university, to the state, and to this country, and to this world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, for your valuable time and mesmerizing speech and enlightening and motivating us to thrive in future. So we have tried to follow the standard practice adopted by our Department of regarding seminar symposium by preparing an abstract of the event. So now I request you to inaugurate the abstract for our participants.
Sir, with your permission, they can share the screen, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. We are now uh, sharing the abstract booklet. Scroll a little faster, if you will. Yes, a bit faster, please. Yeah. Yeah, a bit faster, please. Huh? Get, get to the content, yes. Is that the end? Yes, sir. I think yes, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is the abstract booklet prepared by the students of our department regarding the symposium. And this will be shared with the participants in due course. OK. So kindly upload it to our website also. And uh, if some articles uh, are properly edited, and if, if it is fine suitable for publication at our university's own journal, we are planning to publish it uh, yes. in the first week of uh, March, by 10th of March. Kind of Dr. Shamas, kind of look into it. Okay. And uh, some articles, if with your uh, prop editorial uh, inputs of your editorial uh, board members or expert members, if it can be uh, placed at your our, uh, you know, this Tech Vista journal. Of course. It would be my privilege. I would take care of it. Sir. Mm. Sir, can I have a request uh, regarding this uh, organization because the students have uh, given the thing and they have made these things, this thing. So I think uh, if you kindly permit, we may appreciate the students with some best oral presentation and poster yeah, yeah. presentation. That, that so that will be, of course. Yeah. <coughs> so that will be a bit motivating and inspiring for yeah, them as well. Yes. Try to appreciate and inspire. Yes. Okay. Th thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I have to leave because I have to join some other program. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, sir for being here. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, sir, we will love the... Sir, we will be highly privileged if you take out some time from your busy schedule and be with us uh, at our directory session, which will be at 4.45 in the afternoon. I cannot say now because I have it uh, now from uh, 10.30 onwards, I have packed schedule till 5 o'clock. <laughs> Check whether you have some gap. I, I, yes, sir. Thank yes. You, Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So now, uh, may I request uh, Dr. Shukhendu uh, Shamaza, Director of School of Applied uh, Science and Technology, to say some introductory remarks. Thank you, Shambhidhi. Namaskar. I have been invited to speak at a very interesting time when I just see the number of participants has touched, scored a century. <laughs> Honorable Vice Chancellor, respected colleagues, 
dear students and participants of uh, what I call the borderless learning community. It's a moment of joy for me. And I would explain with my limited resources, why it is. You see, my, I'm going to say something which uh, your uh, HOD is not going to agree. Uh, my knowledge of chemistry is very, very limited. However, I am passionate about learning, education, and doing things in some sort of a inspired, freewheeling way, differently. So this is one of these occasions. Dr. Ghosh and Dr. Manna, Professor Bhattacharya, Dr. Bhag, we have been talking about it, especially with Dr. Ghosh right from the beginning. And our vice chancellor, sir, he always gives us ample room to try and experiment and learn. And that's the chemical way. We, we do experiments. Some of the experiments succeed, some don't, but uh, that's the way to do it. So this is something I hope you are realizing, especially the participants, the students, uh, the merit of it. At this is not a run-of-the-mill event. This is not the way we typically learn. Now, where is the educational component? That's the question I'm going to put. That's the question I have to convince myself that it has an answer. It actually is giving you some chance to try things out step into a territory that is unknown. See if you put the ingredients, whether the reaction occurs or not. You tweak the parameters. So there was a long time ago in the late 80s when I was a master's student like you in the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. In one of my seniors' hostel room, I saw a poster, some beautiful bards flying, large ones, storks, I think, and the slogan or tagline, whatever you want to call it was, they can because they think they can. So you are trying something. It may not have absolutely, I mean, very, very specific chemical content. But you were trying something and seeing whether it works or not. Therein lies the educational component. Because today, teachers are no longer repositories of information. They are much better repositories. We are here to work together with you. We are here to complement with our wisdom and experience your energy and enterprise. That's the way a team is going to be built. It is our jo job is like the coach. It's like the coach, which becomes a very important part of a winning team. But the team, it is that 11 or five or seven, whoever, that goes to the field and plays the game. Now this doing is going to make you feel a little bit about that, that perhaps we also can. And we are no less. And you get feel excited because whatever you do, graduate actually sparks some other ideas. And already there has been an idea that has been sparked. I will discuss within a few days, hopefully uh, next Tuesday uh, with Dr. Ghosh and Dr. Manna, if they're there in, on campus the next project that we can do together. You might be saying, hey, I'm being a bit uh, presumptuous in calling we're doing it together, but trust me, I have done my part several months ago about it. So it's not that I'm taking credit without, uh, 
without doing anything. And what was my part? My part was transmitting the value of Mr. Vice Chancellor through means that believing in him, believing in your faculty, that yes, we can. I have said all the time to Dr. Ghosh, especially I interact very closely, go ahead and try. If there is any mistake, I take the onus. And I say that to you as well. Go ahead and try. If there is an error, I will take the blame with anybody. Be it the vice chancellor, be it the uh, chief minister, be it the uh, prime minister. Because unless you try, unless and, and with that, and the trial has to be done with a free mind, with not of censoring people looking behind your shoulders. So that's there. So this is a good thing. Now I'm going to say a few things because if I do not say anything about chemistry, other uh, viewers are going to think, man, this guy is really doesn't know anything about chemistry. I will come to that, but I am happy to see Mm, that there is a reasonable amount of participation. And as Mr. Vice Chancellor pointed out, there are participants from outside of this, uh, this university. All of you, I urge you in your next program, invite your uh, friends from the colleges, invite your neighbors, invite your parents, invite your teachers from previous colleges and schools and all that. Let us open it up, as Mr. Visi said, and uh, now all of us know we can only do things together. So there is no wrong. There is nothing secret here you are doing, or there is nothing secret in a good way or bad way that it cannot be. It has to be censored. So that's the thing. And my message, if I may use that big word, to the students of other departments, please pay attention, observe, and learn, and later on so that you too can do something similar. Not just copying, but emulating in a sense, getting inspired and seeing that your colleagues, your peers have taken a charge. It, it, that's how it happens. There is a so football tournament somewhere, and then next in the next neighborhood, there is a day and night cricket tournament, and such things, because okay, so that's there. The third point or, or the other point I would like to make, and these are things that I'm suggesting, I hope some of the student organizers are taking note, that chemistry by many chemists is called the central science because you cannot do any research, any knowledge creation from astrology through biology to, uh, I mean, astro archaeology. I, I kind of said astrology, but uh, let us put that aside. Archaeology through biology to astronomy without chemistry. For example, one of the great works that is being done nowadays by David Reich's group in, in Harvard with some collaboration with the, uh, the, uh, an institute in Hyderabad is on ancient DNA. And with that work has revealed and, and clarified tremendously who we are and how we got here. And that's based in chemistry. Then in about 20, 2014 and so, the, some research revealed evidence of complex branched molecules from 27,000 light years away in space, which is lending credence to the hypothesis that perhaps life on Earth was seeded by extraterrestrial molecules. It is no, no, no fantasy now. Astrobiology is becoming, is shaping is one of the major areas in the last five years. And then, aware or not, expert or not, our lives are governed by chemistry. In 2014, Eric 
Betzig and two colleagues, compare, I mean, co workers, they got Nobel Prize in chemistry by inventing new methods for seeing inside a live cell. So these are some examples of chemistry being part of us, part of this universe. And the point is application. Application means it is not abstraction. Now, this chemistry is the central science. Now, what is the central technology? The central technology is information technology or computer technology, whichever way you try to see that. As a biped, we know it is much easier to walk with two legs. What I would argue is to meld, to merge the central science and the central technology. So next presentation, next session or what, I would like you to do jointly maybe with uh, people of, uh, in this university or somewhere else with the information technology department, computational department, because this so-called AI and machine learning that is revolutionized. And we are introducing those goals. Dr. Manna is well aware of it. Dr. Bush, of course, is there, knows. But that would make the journey much more interesting, contemporary, and contributory. So please keep that in mind that you interact because you see the four C's of higher education in the 21st century are what? They are creative think, uh, I mean, critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication. So that's this collaboration, if you do, none of us uh, know everything. I mean, that, that's, that's actually a, rid a ridiculous statement. We know only very small part. So we collaborate and we make things complete. If you look at any decent publication with some impact, maybe something in the proceedings, PNS or science or nature, you will see so many. And if you do a bit of the research that, okay, you see an average paper from nature in the 1930s and today, the number of contributors required to make a meaningful contribution has increased exponentially because the knowledge is increasing exponentially. And we can only be specialists if we want to contribute. Cannot, we cannot really make a, a meaningful contribution in a general way. So anyway, that's the idea that this is a great, uh, this is something I feel excited about because we were thinking about it when the department was only an idea, not a reality. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for eliminating it, for uh, sharing your concept and road of map for, to, be, for, to be followed by us in future. Now I would like Dr. Tapos Ghosh, HOD of Department of Applied Chemistry to say a few words. Thank you, uh, Ramshikta. And uh, before I say something, I would like to thank uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, for taking time uh, to inaugurate the symposium. And also, our director, sir, I mean, he has been as just a few seconds back, he said that uh, working when it was an idea only, not even in existence in physical terms. Uh, so uh, we have been working closely to uh, bring or to give a shape of this department. And that has to be aligned with the mission and vision of the university. That is, as the vice chancellor sir, uh, rightfully mentioned that uh, the thriving areas where we have to contribute. And that has to be uh, a bit, I, I do not say different, but the application has to be uh, incorporated into the conventional things that we were carrying out. That's why this is applied chemistry, not the chemistry only. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, the students have taken the course and they have taken it seriously. Uh, as far as I can, uh, I know regarding the presentations and the content of the symposium, it, it is, I mean, 
nano uh, technology and in the fabrication so this is something uh, emerging and right uh, very important things and all all different aspects uh, from different era zones that the students will cover uh, so it's of sheer joy for me as the director sir said very beginning so i am feeling very joyful right here today and uh, i thank all uh, my esteemed colleagues, directors, sir, of course, in the beginning. And also, I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Radhavallo Bhar, sir, although he couldn't uh, join here uh, because he's traveling in the bus. It's crowded, so it is a difficulty for him. But uh, he has been also there uh, so far, whatever we have reached to. So he has been there since the beginning also uh, when he has joined. So uh, I'm thankful to him as well. Uh, and also, I would like to say that uh, to shape this syllabus and curriculum content, which is not uh, typically matched with the conventional ones. I would like to thank our BOS members, all the esteemed members, of course, because they have uh, taken the time, the precious time uh, from their research and uh, the other activities. They have uh, shared their time with us to shape it, the content of the program in such a way that uh, what from my point of view or the departmental point of view, we think the students has to be employable. That is a concern for us. Now to be employable, you must acquire some skill and get some mastery on that apart from your conventional chemistry knowledge. That comes from your UG background. And of course you will get that in your master's platform. But apart from that knowledge, you need to have some, uh, I mean, cutting edge skill like for, Organizing this one, you, you acquire the uh, organizing skill, how to organize a symposium. What does it take to organize? What are the structure of uh, doing things? What are the technical sessions? I hope uh, who are organizing this, they, they already have learned because they have spent enormous time for last three weeks minimum. Uh, they started long back, but for last three weeks, they have been working very hard. So uh, the best wishes to all of them all my students, uh, uh, the second year students, they have taken the uh, more pain <laughs> to, to bring it uh, today. And also the first year students who have participated and who have been part of the organizing committee. So uh, being a part of the department, I feel a sheer joy and very nice to be here. Thank you for uh, letting me to speak out a few words from my end. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your words. May I now ask Professor Shubhash Chandra Bhattacharya, sir, Department of Applied Chemistry, what's in this inauguration session? Good morning to all of you. Respected Vice Chancellor, Professor Shoikot Maitro, Director, Dr. Shukendu Samasdar, HOD, Dr. Tapos Ghosh, my esteemed colleagues, and dear students, I am extremely happy to be present in this seminar organized by students. Here the speakers are the, our postgraduate post students of our university and other universities. So it is not easy to organize a seminar within a very short time. Our students have done a great job. Teachers feel happy to witness the success of students. So I am very happy. Uh, the topics in this seminar are very interesting and I feel the participants will enjoy this. And there is a proverb we know that physics among basic sciences, physics is the philosophy of science. Mathematics is the language of science and chemistry is the art of science. So we have to, act, we have to acquire, you have to acquire this art. So uh, I think participants will be interested in these lectures. With this, I wish the seminar will be every success, seminars will be every success. Thank you all. Thank you, Bhattacharya, sir, for your words. So now we are almost at the closing of our inaugural I would uh, now take the opportunity to thank Vice Chancellor Sir, Director Sir, Dr. Ghosh Sir, and Bhattacharya Sir, and all other 
authors and dignitaries who has taken the time to join the inaugural session. I am grateful to all the participants and audiences for being a part of our symposium program. I would also request all of you to stay connected and enjoy the program to the fullest. So now we will start the first session of our program. Uh, may, may, has... may, I, may I make a uncalled for suggestion, please? Yes, sir, sure. Just from experience, maybe I'm wrong, but usually we run over time. So please make sure that every presentation is within time. So whoever is going to say, make it brief and to the point. I know I have spilled over time a little somewhat, but otherwise it would just keep on accumulating. So this would be my suggestion that from your end, whoever is keeping, keeping things in order, keep a very, give, uh, give the speaker an indication that three minutes left or whatever. So the complete cycle time remains within 10 minutes. Thank you. Yes, sir. I hope they will take yes, care of that. And uh, just let me uh, tell you, uh, inform you that we are, so far we are on sheet schedule. We are about to start on 10.50 and we are one minute to go to 10.50. So I think so far we are good to go. And definitely what Sarah have said, that has to be taken, uh, I mean, very rightfully. And you have to inform all the participants. I think uh, Shambhriti or uh, whoever is taking care of that session will definitely note that and sir, that will they, they will take care, of course. Thank you, sir, for pointing out that one. Thank you, sir. So we are now starting the first session. We have 11 oral PPTs here and we have two students we will be delivering the presentation from Sister Nivedita University and Calcutta University. Uh, so now I would request Dr. Shuhash Chandra Bhattacharya, Dr. Tapos sir, to chair the session. Uh, thank you, Shan Shikta, for uh, giving us the opportunity to chair the session. And I think, sir, uh, Bhattacharya, sir, yes, I yes. think they can proceed for the beginning of the technical session one, which is the oral presentation. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, please, first speaker. Uh, now, let us and start. Once again, I, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, yes. It is obvious I'm restating it. Since uh, we, there is some sort of an award, I think three top presenters and all that, I, I would request the, the session chairs to eventually take care of that so that you propose it uh, for them. So, please. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. So the, our first speaker uh, from PG two PG second year student. Yes. Uh, so please, speaker uh, first speaker uh, who is first speaker? I think Aparajita Odikari sir. Yes sir. Um, Aparajita Odikari. Yes. I think uh, I think uh, Shomnath. Uh, uh, will take care and uh, he can invite the students one after another. Yes, he yes. has the schedule as well. And, and inform our uh, yes, sir. Prem Kumar, yes, just so that they have this right to share their screen. So, Aparajita Adhikari, student yes, of second sir. year of our university, please start. And please, uh, Dr. Samazdar has already said that, please maintain your time and uh, uh, give us all, at least three minutes for discussion. Okay, start. Thank you, sir. I, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Are audible, please share your screen. Uh, is, is it visible? Yes, yes, visible. Make it full screen. Make it full. Yes, visible. Yeah. Make it full screen. Yeah. Yeah. Is it working, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, so you. Very good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to present on selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs in short. So what is SSRIs? SSRIs are a class of antidepressants used mainly in the treatment of depression and anxiety disorders. It is the safest and most commonly prescribed antidepressants. Uh, why SSRI is called selective? Because they are mainly affect serotonin, not other neurotransmitters. 
in the 1950s the discovery of two new drugs sparked what would become a multi billion dollar market for the antidepressants neither the drug was intended to treat depression at all in fact at that time many doctors and scientists believed that psychotherapy was the only approach to treat depression decades long journey of discovery that followed our understanding of depression and raised the question we hadn't considered before one of those first two antidepressant drugs was ipronized which was intended to treat tuberculosis in 1952 trial it not only cured depression but also improved the mood the discovery led to the production of fluoxetine or prozac in 1987 it was the first of the class of drugs called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors prozac worked well in the market and later other ssris sertraline fluoxetine paroxetine uh, citalopram escitalopram were introduced no ssris are generally administered orally as a form of suspension or solution as tablets or as capsule currently there are no parenteral rectal or other forms are available no ssri have long half lives they are less toxic isme aprajita you are in first slide only oh the slide is not changed yet no you have to reshare it okay 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 Okay, I'm resharing it. Now go to the slide uh, presentation presentation no. mode. Okay, go to the oh. bottom right. Uh, yeah, is it changing? No, it's not. not, not. not. No, 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 no. You have to share the whole, entire screen. Whenever you are clicking on the share screen, you have to click on the first uh, option. Not okay. share. Not share is share the whole screen. Actually, click on the share button. Yes, yeah. yes. Now it is yeah. okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Apna jita, please carry on. Actually, uh, yeah, yeah. Is it changing? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. You continue. Uh, so uh, SSRIs have good absorption. they are easily biotransformed in the liver and they are less toxic here are the few ssri structure as you can see in this picture like citalopram has tertiary amine as functional group and there are other ssris so as you can tell from their name ssri inhibit reuptake of serotonin as they accomplish that by blocking serotonin transporter this result in increased level of serotonin available to bind to post synaptic receptor as you can see in this animation that once serotonin is released the ssri is blocked the synaptic cleft and so reuptake of serotonin is prohibited uh, this whole mechanism of action looks pretty straight forward but then you may think why this antidepressant take weeks to produce maximum benefit well a new research gives us a little insight into why this happened so recently scientists discovered that in people with depression g proteins tend to cluster in the patches of brain cell membranes rich in cholesterol called lipid rafts now when stuck on this rafts g proteins lack the access to molecule called cyclic amp which is necessary to work and transmit signals of serotonin however later on it it was discovered that ssri is also build up in this lipid rafts which resulted in the gradual movement of g proteins out of the rafts toward the region of membrane where they are able to function better so ssri is are mainly used to treat depression and anxiety they are useful in obsessive compulsive disorder panic disorder social anxiety disorder gad that is generalized anxiety disorder and ptsd that is post traumatic stress disorder so sometimes post traumatic stress disorder can last for months or years all ssris are highly bound to plasma proteins ranging from 94% for fluoxetin to 99% for sertraline Escitalopram and fluoxamine are relatively less protein bound, estimated seventy seven percent. 
No, all SSRIs are metabolized by cytochrome 450 enzymes in the liver. Each SSRI has different pharmacokinetics, like sertraline exhibit linear elimination pharmacokinetics with an elimination of half-life of 26 hours, whereas fluxetin shows non-linear pharmacokinetics and it has highest half-life of four to six days. And whereas fluxamine has highest of maximum daily dose of 300 milligram. When it comes to adverse effects, excessive stimulation of serotonin receptors in the brain may lead to insomnia, increased anxiety and irritability. Excessive stimulation of spinal serotonin receptors may lead to stimulation of serotonin receptors in the gastrointestinal tract as well as in the central nervous system may lead to nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Lastly, abrupt withdrawal of an SRI can result in temporary deficiency of synaptic serotonin, which in turn may lead to unpleasant symptoms such as headache, agitation, and sleep disturbances. So SSRI should be prescribed cautiously to patients with renal impairment. These are the few references I collected data from. I solemnly thank Department of Applied Chemistry, Macaut, West Bengal, for their inspiration and constant guidance throughout the presentation. Thank you. Uh, if if anyone have any questions, please ask. I will try to answer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ajita. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Yes, now the, I am asking one thing. So uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of this medicine. Yes, sir. Is it? Obviously, yes. yes. So, but uh, which portion is higher? Advantage position or disadvantage position? Sir, advantage position is higher. Uh, mainly SSRIs uh, are uh, uh, the antidepressant that show least toxic effects or adverse effect than other class of antidepressants. Okay. Okay, any, anyone, anyone, any question? Any questions from anyone? Yeah, especially we will encourage the students because this is uh, your program. So we will uh, appreciate if you ask, ask any question, if you have any query, feel free to ask. The, they are your fellow classmates only, please. So, since there is no question, so may I uh, ask another uh, next participants to present? Uh, sir, I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, sir, I think uh, if we uh, ask Shomnath, Shomnath can ask yes, uh, one yes, by sir. one. Yeah, Shomnath, uh, please uh, take care of that. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Aparajita, for such a nice presentation. For our next participant, we have Obishek Day from Sister Nivedita University. Um, uh, over to you, Abhishek, and please share your screen and give the presentation. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Good morning, yes, sir. Audible. Yes. Uh, yes, I'm audible. Yes. So I'll just uh, take one minute to share this. Yeah, just go to the slide yes. share mode, Abhishek. So, yeah. Is it it's okay, fine. sir? It's fine. Okay, it's okay. fine. Yes, yes sir. Proceed. No. Now it is okay. Okay. So good morning to all the teachers present over here and my fellow friends who are present over here. I am Abhishek Dey, currently pursuing master's in chemistry. Has got this wonderful opportunity to present my topic, synthetic approach of remdesivir uh, at this webinar. So here, if I start with my topic, today I'll be talking about the broad, um, broad spectrum antiviral remdesivir, a monophosphate nucleoside analog which is uh, commonly termed as protide, was repurposed. In May, we know in May 2020, when coronavirus outbreak was in this country, it received an emergency approval by the FDA, the Food and uh, Drug Administration, being the first drug approved to fight the new coronavirus disease, which targets the virus directly. The main synthetic strategies towards remdesivir and their re relevant modifications are present and discussed to provide a panoramic view of the state of the art and more important advance in this field. So if I come to this introduction of this retrosynthetic uh, process of remdesivir, we can see that in 2012, it was discovered 
at C nucleotide mimics containing one substituted four as a seven nine diode as a denosine were analogs of ATP with potent activity against RNA virus. The concomitant outbreak of the Ebola epidemics of 2014 prompted the development of this new specific antivirus. If you see this scheme, where we can see that remdesivir, it is a phosphonimidated product. It is a result of this approach developed by the Gilead Science to fight against the hepatitis C virus. The drug was later claimed as an active against the Ebola virus and other respiratory syndical viruses. If you see in this uh, schematic diagram, it is uh, showing our, uh, us the retrosynthetic uh, analysis of remdesivir. Here we can see the in number one, this is the in, in vitro virus blocks the infection at low micromolecular concentration with high selectivity index. This bioactivator data and the pre-existence of safety and clinical data is FDA approval of one as a repurposed drug for the treatment of several COVID-19 cases, being the first approved treatment that targets the virus. Now the pharmaceutical use of one instead of this compound three we can see over here, improves the potency and efficacy of the treatment. The product one can enter the cells while the permeators of three and its monophosphate derivatives are much lower. Inside the cells, one undergoes an extra modification in, bio, uh, in vivo bioactivation, ultimately leading to the monophosphate. Remdesivir has a low aqueous solubility that suffers fast pass clearance in the liver. Therefore, it is available in the parental dosage form, which contains the sodium, beta cyclodextrin, sulfibutyl ether. However, since the SARS-CoV-2 virus infects multiple tissues, its parental use ensures higher plasmatic drug levels, improving its exposure, imp sorry, improving its exposure and distribution among the target tissues. Now we will come to the synthesis of key fragments of this uh, remdesivir. There are basically three steps. Ret retrosynthetically, it can be disconnected to an activated phosphorylated and an adenosine mimic, which in turn can be further retrosynthetically disassembled to enable an activated pyrrole, along with a suitably protected d ribono one for lactone precursor and a cyanide source. If we come one by one, we can see the first step where we are doing the pyrosynthesis, the first concise and efficient approach to this long-term heterocycle. Two formal pyrrole was treated with hydroxylum O-sulfonic acid in aqueous, H uh, in aqueous KOH to give one amino to pyrrolnitrile. This is my, uh, this is uh, number eight, which is uh, my formal pyrrole, which is treated with hydroxyl O sulfonic acid, as I was telling, and forming this number 10, which is my pyronitrile. This gave us a 43% yield. Along Three minutes slipped. Yes. Along with 37% yield of two pyronitrile. Here we will see that however the synthesis of remdesivir was prepared from 2,5-dimethyl tetrahydrofuron. It was under HCL to give the catalyst. This was exposed to chlorosulfonyl cyanide in emission, resulting in 67% yield. Here is the second step. Here we can see the d ribono one for lactone derivative used for the first generation of synthesis remdesivir was obtained by uh, employing the Albert Goldman oxidation. With, uh, with this process, we developed the lactone. And thirdly, the three generations of the key phosphorylated fragment have been reported. The first product of the first generation obtained in two step, which gave us the 83% yield. And along with this, we got this product. This gave us the synthetic roots of the remdesivir. Now we have got three roots of this remdesivir. Firstly, it's the new antiviral product. It gave us the root in 2012. It was subjected to temporary N-N-Bacillite for an amino protection. And secondly, if I, with the use of N-butyl lithium and TMSL, which gave a 25% yield and second generation gave us a yield of 78 percent in 2016 a multi-gram synthesis of drug and lastly third it gave us a yield of 40 percent with the sequence of uh, LACL and twice LACL complex this gave us the preparative measures of the remdesivir now we are confused with the R isomer and the S isomer R isomer was, uh, was originally uh, effective but ACE isomer was developed due to its great efficacy and selectivity for therapeutic window. So we finally concluded that it's the R isomer which is uh, more suitable for us in the specific drug against coronavirus, which targets the virus and respiratory cardiovascular effects. 
well the discovery of this uh, will go on and we will be obviously prepared next time when the emergency we hope not but if it strikes again so with this we have concluded our conclusion over here and this is all my references and notes from where i've taken this and lastly i would want to thank special thanks of gratitude to the applied chemistry department of macau for organizing a wonderful presentation for the development uh, for the students of chemistry where we can actively take part thank you so thank you mr obisek uh, now this session is open for question uh, anyone may ask question uh, we have a question in the chat box by shobhik kumar that uh, what are the side effects of remdesivir so over to you obisek can you please answer that <coughs> so where is the question i can't see sir uh, so the question is that uh, what is the side effect of using remdesivir the question you yes. can see q and a yes sir side effects of remdesivir yes sir uh, this drug has some side effects and that's why it is not uh, used in large amount I'll, later also it uh, it got discarded and uh, it got stopped use of this remdesivir drug and obviously it is also uh, not advisable to use at the below uh, persons who are below 12 years of age uh, actually it targets uh, it gives us side effects like um, liver diseases and also kidney diseases and if it and if a um, expecting uh, mother is who is uh, about at the expecting stage and uh, the pregnancy stage they will be uh, greatly affected if i give this uh, remdesivir drug to them so uh, these are the one of the most uh, most important uh, drawbacks you can say that it affects the kidney and liver yes it was uh, initially it was uh, prescribed but after that yes, when it was found that it has side effects then it is was controlled yes okay, okay. thank you obisek now sumat please tell next participant yes <clears throat> thank you obisek for such a wonderful presentation that you have presented uh, for our next participant we have uh, koushik chalki from university of calcutta to give his presentation we invite you koushik uh, over to you thank you okay um, i am uh, audible uh, yes you are you yes, are you are, audible. you are audible okay so uh, is it full screen or not not yet full screen no no not yet full screen koushik just make it yeah it okay. is now it is now okay sir good morning everyone i am koushik chalki a student of university of calcutta and uh, today the topic of my discussion is importance of iron balanced state in nico fe nano sheet array catalyst for the oxygen evolution reaction so at first we have to learn, uh, we have to know why the oxygen evolution reaction is actually important in this scenario and then we will look into the uh, catalyst now moving forward to the introductory part actually uh, 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 hydrogen hydrogen is the most uh, appropriate candidate for nowadays as a renewable source of energy and uh, in this case uh, we can uh, uh, i mean uh, we can uh, the the attractive strategies of producing a hydrogen is the electrochemical splitting of water that is the most most easy thing but in case of electrochemical water splitting uh, at anode there is oxygen uh, production uh, production and at cathode we get hydrogen now in anode the oxygen evolution reaction is a four electron proton coupled process that, that's why it demands a higher over potential to surmount the sluggish kinetics that's why we strongly dependent on the catalytic properties of oxygen evolution reaction catalyst at the anode and the development of ternary non noble metal electrocatalyst is actually mostly necessary in this case and ding at all use template method to prepare a iron modulated nickel hydroxide low crystalline catalyst which actually requires a low over potential of 310 millivolt and at a benchmark current density of 10 milliampere per centimeter square now uh, get into the catalyst and uh, the catalyst is actually prepared by the cation exchange method To, to to prepare a nickel foam and then uh, we introduce the precursor as FeSO4 or Fe2SO4 whole three. Now the, the high hierarchical structure, large surface area, and long uh, and a strong electronic interaction. This all actually made this catalyst 
um, uh, as a high uh, oxygen evolution reaction catalytic activity and also its long term stability. Now, the main thing is that when Fe2 salt, that is FeSO4 was chosen as a precursor, the obtained NiCO FeNF catalyst exhibits the low tefl slope and small charge transfer resistance comparatively lower over potential and higher current density value with respect to if we use Fe3 as a precursor. Moving forward to the schematic uh, preparation procedure, we actually have the NiCO Fe nanosheet added by uh, uh, hydrothermal reaction of nickel hydro, nickel uh, 2 and cobalt 2 in the bare NF uh, nanosheet. And then we use a cation exchange process to introduce the precursor either Fe2 or Fe3 as uh, what we uh, want to use. Now, these are the characterization of the catalyst. From scanning electron microscope, we can see that in above figure, the, mic the macroscopic 3D skeleton of NF is shown with smooth surface and also the abundant channels between the skeleton. These abundant channels actually facilitate the oxygen bubbles to escape. And also these are the enlarged picture of the previous one, which actually showed, which actually showed that the, the whole catalyst is actually covered by the vertically arranged nanosheet array, which actually are very effective in this case. Now we're moving forward. This is a uh, this is the pictures uh, we got from transmission electron microscope, that is TEM. And in this case, we found the, 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 the catalyst contains very weak lattice fringes in small parts. And also the catalyst has a low crystallinity. This low crystallinity structure and uh, very weak uh, lattice fringes and also from this part, we can, uh, we can see that the whole catalyst, the nano sheet is actually uniformly distributed, have uniformly distributed oxygen, iron, cobalt, nickel, all the elements. These all, slipped. These all properties actually, uh, these, these all properties actually show its high effectivity in, in regarding the oxygen evolution reaction. Now, these are the XPS photoelectron spectrometer uh, structure where we see that if we use Fe2 as a precursor, we will get a, uh, here we will get a Fe2P signal, but if we use Fe3 as a precursor, we will not get an iron signal. Also, and this thing actually, uh, this thing actually uh, has the significant effect in the composition of Ni this catalyst. Also, if we use Fe2 as a uh, precursor, but not Fe3, there are many types of problems. Like uh, the nickel signal is reduced. Also, the cobalt signal is reduced in case of Fe3 as a precursor. So finally, we will compare uh, Fe2 and Fe3. If we use Fe3, we can see that the, uh, the base oxygen evolution uh, uh, catalytic activity is actually, is actually executed in the over potential of 293, which is very low in case of Fe2 as a, pre Fe Fe2 as a precursor, but in case of Fe3, it is high. Also, the over potential and the uh, and the current density value also favored that if it two uh, precursor is the most effective uh, case in in this um, scenario. Now uh, here these these uh, in figure C this all uh, this also actually represents that if it two is the highly favored uh, precursor and finally uh, from the figure D that is the tefl slope of uh, NiCO Fe NF FeSO4 if we use FeSO4 as a a precursor, then the tefl slope has the lowest slope. This this line is actually for Fe two as a precursor, and this line is actually for uh, Fe three as a precursor. So these all but these all experimental evidences actually lead us to the conclusion that if we use NiCO Fe uh, in a, a NF Fe SO four as a precursor, then we will get the highest oxygen evolution reaction catalytic activity as compared to Fe three. This is actually the effect of iron state iron balance state. Now to conclude, we are preparing the NiCO Fe NF nanosheet array catalyst with the excellent oxygen evolution reaction properties. Now the valence state, uh, which actually we uh, discussed, that is Fe2 Fe3 uh, in the iron salt precursor, has a significant influence. Obviously, now when Fe2 is used as a uh, salt precursor, the prepared catalyst needs low over potential, high current uh, densities, which we actually want in this scenario. And these all findings are actually important in the in-depth understanding of the formation mechanism of the catalyst, and also with different iron precursor no, and advantages no, no, no. for developing inexpensive no, no. transition metal-based catalysts for water electrolysis. And these are the references from uh, where we get the information about these research findings. Now, uh, I like to acknowledge to special uh, my special thanks to the gratitude to the chemistry department of my university, University of Calcutta. I also acknowledge my parents and friends. And also, I uh, like to 
I also acknowledge the applied chemistry department of uh, Mac uh, Macau uh, for arranging the, this good uh, symposium where I can take part. Thank you all. So now the session is open for question. So and Kosik will be happy to answer questions. So any questions from anyone? Uh, may I ask a question? There is one in the chat box, please. Okay, okay. Oh, in the chat, uh, in the chat box, there is a question, Kosik. Yeah. Koshik, uh, should I read it out for you? Yes. Uh, so, one minute, sir. Yeah. So, the question is why NICO FE NF shows high OER catalytic activity? Okay. Uh, actually, uh, uh, the thing is that um, uh, in this presentation is actually about the uh, FE2, FE3, its balance state. Actually, uh, I mean, the reference is not uh, say about the, I mean, this thing. Um, actually, the thing is that the, the whole catalyst is, is uh, I mean, from the scanning electric microscope, the picture, the, uh, I mean, the, the, the channel between the uh, microscope, I mean, the, in the catalyst and also and uh, these, uh, these, uh, the, the, the rough surface, this all actually leads to its uh, catalytic activity. But uh, in brief, uh, I mean, I'm not exactly sure how it actually operates, but these are the advantageous things of, of this catalyst, which I can say. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ghosh? Yeah, Koshik, in your XPS uh, diagram, I think a couple of slides later on, yes. uh, where you have the graph plotted, yeah. So you said that uh, it's that some anomaly in case of Fe3 plus salts yes. when we deviate from Fe2 to Fe3, right? Yes, sir. So according to you, what can be the reason, probable reason for this anomaly? Is there any specific things in, in terms of valency? Um, you, you said, right? Uh, from yes. the A plot, I guess, uh, the anomaly is there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, but uh, any specific reason for having that? Uh, the uh, specific reason actually it depends on reduction potential. Hmm. Uh, okay. It depends on reduction potential. So that is why uh, this anomaly. Uh, and another point, Kosik, I think that uh, have you seen uh, what is the uh, turnover value that is uh, how many times the catalyst can be used what is reproducibility reusable uh, sir uh, i am not okay okay sure. okay it will have to uh, uh, that done at least number of times then it can be said okay uh, so thank you Mr. Yeah. There, is another question okay. in the there is another question in the chat box. Oh, oh sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, so I can read out Koshik for it uh, for you. Yes, it's uh, why they are low crystalline structures. Okay, why they are low crystalline structures, sir? Uh, and uh, what do you mean by low crystalline structure, basically? So low crystalline structure means, I mean, if the catalyst is crystallatically compact, then uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the surface area will be low and uh, its effectivity in catalytic active, uh, I mean, in its catalytic effectivity will be uh, less. If the okay. crystallinity is lower, then it will effectively uh, work in, 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 I mean, it effectively, uh, the catalysis process will be effective. Oh, okay. okay. So do you mean by, Crystallinity being lower means part of it is crystalline and part of it is amorphous. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Is that what you mean? Okay. Some defects in there in the crystallinity, I guess. So and, uh, it's not fully single crystal or any crystalline structure. Okay. Okay, Koshik. Thank you. Okay. For your interaction as well. Uh, thank you, Koshik. Next speaker, Somnath, please tell. Yes, sir. Uh, for our next, um, thank you, Koshik, for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, for our next speaker, we have Doymonti Dan from MSc Applied Chemistry, first year. So, Doymonti, over to you. So, Koshi, can you please uh, stop sharing? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, Doymonti, over to you. Yes, I am sharing my screen. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Oh. 
is it visible sir uh, yes yes visible yeah yes visible visible okay so good morning everyone glad to have you all uh, i am damayantina the first year applied chemistry student of macout uh, today my topic uh, is covid 19 how chemistry matters so let's decode the topic so we all know for the last 2 years how covid 19 has been affecting our lives continuously our normal lifestyle has changed totally in this 2 year so we are uh, now trying to survive in this situation the new normal situation soap sanitizer disinfectant have become the most uh, necessary objects of our daily life but why are we using these to protect us how they work what is the chemistry behind it uh, in this symposium i will try to explain these facts uh, in this covid 19 situation how they are protecting us so my uh, first point is effect of soap uh, we all know doctors and scientists are strictly advising us to wash our hands with soap frequently but how soap is protecting us soap is a surface active agent Uh, the soap molecule looks like a pin with a head and a tail part you can see this uh, in the picture also the head part is hydrophilic part which makes bond with water and the other tail part is hydrophobic part which repels water molecule but uh, makes the bond uh, with uh, oily lipid layer and break it so when we wash our hands with soap if there is covid virus in our hands the hydrophobic part of soap molecule attacks the oily lipid layer and breaks it and the other hydrophilic part mixes with water so uh, it can be washed off easily but if we wash our hands only with water it can't break the lipid layer of virus so washing hands uh, only with water uh, will not be effective in any way the next point is effect of sanitizer sanitizer is also playing a important role uh, in prevention of covid-19 we can't have the facility of washing hands everywhere especially during our traveling but we have to keep our hands sanitized every time here sanitizer becomes the life savior usually sanitizer is prepared with 60% of alcohol and 40% of water so very commonly isopropyl alcohol or ethanol is used to make sanitizer the alcohol part can break the lipid layer of the virus and destroys its effectivity the water part mainly works as the carrier so that the every ingredient can reach every part of the hand the sanitizer breaks the hydrogen bonds of virus which breaks the specific shape of the virus and make and make is ineffective but the very frequent use of sanitizer and soap can harm our skin also uh, we all know that the soap and sanitizer can break the lipid layer of the virus but our hands has the same lipid layer okay so uh, when we use soap and sanitizer frequently they extract lipid and moisture from our skin and our skin becomes dry uh, sometimes severe skin problem arises so glycerin uh, can be a solution for this and glycerin is added to soap and sanitizer as a humectant which means that glycerin can keep the moisture intact in our skin and protect our skin from getting dry so the next point is surface disinfectant how surface disinfectant is effective covid 19 virus said. covid 19 virus lies not only in our skin surface but also in the surface of floor furniture etc to keep the surface clean we use surface disinfectant uh, the main use of surface disinfectant is bleach we all know that bleach is a very strong oxidizing agent the function of disinfectant is quite similar uh, to the soap and the sanitizer it also uh, attacks the lipid layer of virus and it breaks the hydrogen bonds and then remove the hydrogen atoms from the virus after uh, losing the hydrogen atoms the molecular structure of the virus uh, will change effectively and it can't work anymore on affecting us 
my next point is the idea of vaccine so covid 19 virus uh, some spikes covid 19 virus has some spikes of protein in its body that make it dangerous but at the same time the spikes are giving us uh, the way to make vaccine uh, we know that we are using uh, soap sanitizer disinfectant but they are not the permanent solution so to restrict the uh, effectivity of covid 19 we need a permanent solution which is the vaccine so how it works how vaccine is made during the antibody test of covid 19 uh, it can be detected in anyone's body through this protein spikes usually vaccines contain uh, weakened or inactive parts of a particular organism which is called the antigen the blueprint of this antigen part is made in the lab firstly then it is injected as vaccine in our body as the sample so when the actual virus attacks us our body can recognize them and produce specific antibodies against the virus if any was is infected by the virus even after getting the vaccine these antibodies stops them from replicating so this is the idea of vaccine general idea and uh, this is it for today here are some references of my presentation and i would like i am thankful to the department of applied chemistry macout uh, for inspiring and guiding me throughout the presentation and thank you everyone thanks uh, so damanti thank you for your nice presentation uh, now there is a question i think uh, now this is open for question and uh, in chat box there is question uh, is it possible for you to see yeah can you see or we can read it out no sir please read it okay the first question is from amrita she asked that why we should not rub our hands with sanitizer during cooking uh, yes uh, the uh, we should sanitize our hands before cooking it is uh, very important but we should not use the alcohol based sanitizer uh, rather we should use the soap because sanitizer uh, contains alcohol and it is highly flammable so it can be a disaster of uh, using alcohol during cooking yes one is uh, why ethanol is used in sanitizer but uh, not methanol and uh, has yes sir Ethan ethanol is a weaker acid than water but methanol has a level of acidity slightly higher than the water and the ethanol we can uh, we eat ethanol in the alcohols uh, like uh, the uh, which we eat uh, we drink usually but methanol can harm us it is very toxic and it can uh, one spoon of methanol can blind one man so we should not use uh, ethanol in this sanitizer rather we use the uh, sorry so we should not use methanol rather than we use ethanol okay there is another hey. one uh, which is better to use soap or sanitizer sir uh, obviously we should use uh, uh, soap rather than sanitizer because uh, hand washing reduces all forms of infections uh, pathogens and removes potentially dangerous chemicals such as pesticides from the hands uh, we all uh, we can wash all things by the soap but using sanitizer uh, sanitizer it only kills the germ uh, and not the other darts so it is very safe to use soaps rather than sanitizer the soap is a ultimate protection from anything okay thank you damanti for your interaction and answering the questions thank you sir sounded like an advertisement from a soap uh, producing ultimate yeah. protection against anything yes sir uh, the tagline there okay sir thank <laughs> you sir I, I, i have a question to yes damanti. yes 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 hey damanti yes. say you were listening you were not the presenter but this yes. presentation was being given and you were in the audience okay okay sir what question would you have asked uh tumi audience e acho eta onno keu presentation ta dilo tumi ki prashno korte now i have no idea as i am giving the presentation so the Now, question that is, that is why i am asking this this is you see we must have 
these kind of things in mind. Okay. Actually, presentation to Irikora should at lead engender more questions. So keep that in mind in future. Yes, sir. Thank you. The only thing, one point the, that type of soap is very useful. Who makes oh, leather very much? Actually, leather formation is necessary to wash the. Uh, yes, coating. sir. Yes, sir. Leather. Yes, sir. Yes. But, Bhattacharya, yes, sir, you have to be lucky to live in a region where the water is not hard. <laughs> yes, absolutely <laughs> okay absolutely yeah. well so, thank you damanti thank, thank you, you yeah next next speaker next. yeah shomnath please uh, call on our next speaker uh thank you damanti for such a mesmerizing presentation uh for our next participant we have uh, deblina shaha from um MSc Applied Chemistry, uh, second year, Macau. And over to you, Devlina, for your presentation. Devlina? Devlina, start. Please start. Please make it full screen or size slideshow mode. Yeah. Carry on, please. Carry on, start. You are not audible, Diplina, sir. If you are using headphone, then you can remove the headphone. Very, very, very low sound. Hello, sir. You can keep the mic closer. Now my voice is clear. Tapa, sir. <clears throat> Yes, Prem, yes. The sound is very low, sir. Is it audible, sir? Yeah, I can hear you. Low, very low. Devlina Shah, sir. Devlina Shah, please uh, speak something. Hello, sir. I am audible. Yeah, yeah. Just increase yeah, the now volume, audible. please. You are please audible. Please. It is very low. Make it louder. I hear my uh, Yes, volume. yes, yes. Continue. Okay, sir. Thank you. So, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. I am Devrina Shaha, and I am in MSc second year on Applied Chemistry, Macout. So, today I am going to present the topic, uh, Nanotextile, the future fabric. Uh, make it slide so. Uh, is it, you are Press going. enter, the next slide will come. Press next. So it is not changing? No, it is uh, not changing. Arrow button, see in the, your keyboard, there is arrow button. You have to go to the next arrow button. Yes, I'm clicking in the arrow button, but uh, it is not changing. Then please reshare it. Please reshare it once again. It may be sure. hanged. Can you please stop sharing and reshare it? Again, reshare. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay, sir. So here our first discussion uh, will be what is nanomaterials and what is nanotechnology. 
So nanomaterials can be defined uh, as chemical substances or materials having dimension between one and hundred nanometer. So one nanometer is about to ten uh, one lakh times smaller than the um, diameter of uh, a human hair. So from this comparison, we can avail uh, to imagine that how much small the nanomaterials are. And on the other hand, the nanotechnology is designed characterization and production and application structures, devices, and system by controlling shape and size at the nanoscale. So now we are coming to our uh, futuristic uh, clothing that is the nanofabric. So nanofabrics are the textile engineered with small particles that give a, a ordinary, extraordinary materials uh, to advantageous properties. As we know that the nano size materials exhibit some unique properties that affect the physical, chemical, and biological behavior. Uh, like this, the nanofabric has also some unique characteristics. So nanoparticles in ordinary fabric uh, improves the thermal comfort, reduces body temperature by 4.5 degrees centigrade, shields harmful UV rays, and improves the washing durability. The nano, uh, the another amazing property uh, is that the nanotechnology fabric never gets wet. So nanofabric has a high water resistant property because the polyester nanofibers are coated by the silicon nanofilaments, uh, which are the highly and chemically hydrophobic. So this is why the coating prevents the water droplet from soaking. So here I will come to the manufacturing process of the uh, there is a, first is the sol gel method and the second is the intrusioning method and i will briefly shortly discuss about the two production methods in the left side picture uh, there is a schematic diagram of sol gel method uh, in the sol gel process uh, the nanoparticles first are dissolved in a solvent mainly alcohol uh, then when it is dissolved, then the several chemical reactions occur. So first, uh, a, na a nanoparticle is grown, uh, and then the network, uh, nano, the network of nanoparticle transform the uh, solution uh, into a colloid like gel texture. Finally, the colloid must go to the uh, drying process for the remove the excess so uh, solvent, and then the nanofabric is produced. In the next right side picture, we are seeing the schematic diagram of electrospinning method. So at first, the polymer solution is uh, put into a syringe and uh, aimed directly opposite to the electric field. A strong electric field is applied. Uh, and then when the force of attraction between the polymer fiber and electric plate exceed mm -hmm. the surface tension of the solution, then the nanofiber is produced and it is deposited to the fiber. So in this way, the nanofabric is produced. Advantage application of nanoparticles by film synthesis. So uh, now the question which is why nanotechnology is using in textile industry. So uh, we saw and materials have some uh, unique properties. Using those unique properties in text industry, we can design more uh, advanced and smarter clothes. For example, the stain repellent property. So the nanoparticles of silica surface uh, create a coating that repels water and stain. It creates the inner surface tension to ensure that the liquid from beads uh, that roll off the fabric. Next property like UV protection property. So the nanoparticles uh, of titanium dioxide, Three minutes left. dioxide scatter the ultraviolet light in sunlight and protect our garments uh, or our skin also from the sun damages. So another property is antibacterial property. The nano silver particles uh, which uh, charged ion to the stop bacteria cell functioning and it prevents the odor. Another uh, property we can say that uh, the flame resistant property. So the polymer nanocomposite has the aluminum containing clay, which enhance the uh, structure, um, network structure and the polymer matrix. And this improves the flame retardance property in uh, clothes. 
so there are other um, unique properties also we can see that sensoring it is smart textile and it also gives the ultra strength uh, of the our clothes so here are some applications first is military invested uh, fabrics reinforced which uh, nano fiber is high performance lightweight tents and that can better endure uh, for heavy wear and tear Uh, second is the face mask which uh, when it is exposed to light it kills the virus and bacteria third is the knife and bullet resistant uh, suit which uh, containing the nano particle based uh, fabric and uh, it remain re remain flexible but uh, upon impact uh, it becomes hard uh, fourth is the aerogel based uh, socks uh, which prevent the our feet from getting cold in the winter weather uh, five is the nanotech swim suit which repels the water and uh, prevent the swim suit from getting um, wet during swimming um, there are other also various application in textile industry of nanoparticles but uh, there is a question uh, which arises that the nanotech clothes uh, is totally safe for us does the nanoparticles affect the human health so the answer may be yes uh, you have to think twice about uh, buying such clothes it may harm the environment and human health also so many studies have found that the nanoparticles from cloth getting wet wash water and pollute the water system it also creates the nanotoxicity of aquatic species but when it came to human health uh, many studies found that the nano silver was released from the fabric uh, during a uh, workout uh, it uh, goes through our skin and uh, through uh, the sweat and when nano titanium dioxide uh, is used uh, for um, high ultraviolet protection it it may also uh, absorb uh, by skin and uh, it um, seriously uh, cause the skin health issues um, so um, uh, to get rid from these harmful effects uh, we must have it uh, to buying the nano silver and nano titanium oxide coated clothes actually so in this uh, conclusion we can say that uh, taking all those challenges advantages and disadvantages uh, nano fabric uh, opens up a new era to the modern textile industry which uh, make uh, it the future fabric for us definitely so now i'll uh, stop my presentation here i would like to thank our respected teachers for helping in this seminar presentation and giving me this opportunity to present in front of all of you in my desired topic and i also like to thank my uh, classmates for cooperation thank you thank you now it is open for question uh there are questions in chat box uh you know if you want i can read it out for you yes sir please can you read it yeah so the first question is from shobhik kumar Uh, he asked that please explain how nanotech clothes shows antibacterial property if there is any okay nano uh, there is a uh, silver particle based nano clothes uh, which uh, there is a property of silver nano particles when we are using it in this uh, clothes or textile uh, it has yeah. antibacterial property it prevents the bacteria um, bacterial cell um, uh, from growing and it uh, it uh, prevents the bacteria from from actually it prevents it has a uh, unique property of uh, silver nanoparticles to prevent the bacterial cell so when used right in the nano uh, it shows its property yes it is an antibacterial yes. yeah Yes. Next, next question. There is another question: How nanotech clothes acts as UV protected clothes? Actually, there is a, a another nanoparticle which is the um, titanium dioxide. When we use titanium dioxide, it uh, on clothes, uh, it it shows the property and scatter the UV light uh, and protect our garments and our skin. Okay, Debrina. The third question is: Can nanotech clothes act as flame retardant? Yes, it has a property to flame retardant property because uh, in when uh, yeah, there is another nanoparticle which is aluminium, 
when we aluminium uh, use uh, aluminium nanoparticle when we are using in clothes it it containing a aluminium clay the, and it it grows a network that uh, polymer matrix and it improves the retardant property of flame so okay thank you sir would you like to ask something i think yeah. i would like to share my screen if i may sure sir sure sure any time sir Okay, can you can you see? Yes, sir. Now it's visible. Yes, sir. So probably music is not coming. Mm hmm. That was the demonstration okay. that actually this hydrophobicness. Hydrophobic yes, nature. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank, Thank you sir. very much, sir. I mean, that's innovative, of course. I mean, a hands on, it's kind of hands on demonstration. Yes, so this is another uh, suggestion for the students or everybody that you can show things which you can relate to. Sir. Okay. Uh, sir, Thank next. you. So thank, thank you, you again. again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, uh, next, next, on, next, next participant. Uh, thank you, Deblina, for such a nice um, presentation on nanotextile. Uh, for our next presentation, we have Rahul Das from MSc Applied Chemistry First Year Macau to give the presentation. So, over to you, Rahul. Yes, I'm present. Visible? Yes, it is visible. Please make it in slideshow view and please uh, be a bit louder. Your voice is very good. Okay. Now start. Good morning, everyone. My topic is green fluorescent protein and its application on molecular and cellular products. So, first of all, we have to know what is green fluorescent protein. So uh, the green fluorescent protein is such kind of a protein that exhibits bright green fluorescence when it is exposed to light or in the blue to ultraviolet region. And the natural source of this protein is the jellyfish named Aquaria victoria. And it was first isolated from, by Japanese chemist Osamu Shimomura. Scientist Roger T. Stan, Osamu Shimomura, and Martin Chalfi received Nobel Prize in Chemistry on 10 October 2008 for their discovery and work on this protein, on this fluorescent protein. And it absorbs blue light at 395 nanometer and emits green light at 508 nanometer with quantum yield of 0.72 to 0.85. And a enhanced version of GFP was discovered in 1995. And it, the enhanced GFP, it allowed to for, for the practical use of GFPs in mammalian cells. Or, by, or in biological system. So, and the structure of GFP consists of 11 standard beta barrel threaded by an ion, and it contains an alpha helix running up the axis of the cylinder. Where each strand contains approximately 9 to 13 residues of total of one total of 238 amino acid residues. The chromophore contains para hydroxy benzylene imidazole tone and it, con it, al it almost sitting in the center of the cylinder and it consists of on three amino acid residues, serine 65, tyrosine 66, and glycine 67. The chromophore absorbs blue light and emits green fluorescence. Now, the advantages of green fluorescent protein. There is many advantages of this protein and GFP can be heritable that allows us for, for continuous study of cells and tissues 
and this is a natural occurring protein and can be used on live cells it is also non invasive and visualizing is gfp is non invasive and it is then it is real time analysis and it is non toxic for our biological system this does not also interfere with biological processes and there is many applications of uh, green fluorescent proteins like it it used as biosensors for metal ion detection redox sensing in biological system biological marker and cancer research <coughs> biosensors uh, gfp is able uh, green fluorescent protein is able to fluorescence generate fluorescence in live tissues in in absence of any cofactors and that helps to dynam study dynamic molecular events within living cells it is in spectros uh, the spectroscopic method that is called fluorescence resonance energy transfer or fred it is used to detect molecular interaction in biological system fred in fred there a fred involves two g um, uh, resonance energy transfer between two gfps or one gfp and one second fluorophore thus protein she will slip in living cells can be measured metal ion detection gfp is also used for metal ion detection in biological system and a uh, mutant of gfp that is eg neat that preferentially binds g2 and copper 2 and shows noticeable change in fluorescence and also a histidine modified gfp is engineered that can detect the concentration of 10 nanomolar concentration of copper 2 ion another engineered gfp can is in, in gfp is engineered that can that is highly sensitive at has a sensitive to lead ions at micromolar concentration but it is also used as biological marker it can gfp this protein can be fused to any other proteins and it effectively making those proteins fluorescent this uh, this allows to any protein to be localized and tracked using this protein in biological system it is also used in cancer research to track and label cancer cells gfp labels cancer cells have been used to model metastasis in our body conclusion the gfp is the fundamental part of fluorescence microscopy due to ease of use and its flexibility and its constant improvements on gfp over time have caused fluorescence microscopy and research to move forward acknowledgement i express my sincere gratitude and appreciation to the department of lab chemistry of magamul Macout, West Bengal. I have some references. Thank you. Thanks, Rahul. Now, uh, questions or uh, questions from audience. Uh, there is question in the chat box. How GFP is stacked to the pro protein? GFP is stacked by gene in uh, DX. it is mainly done by gene encoding process of that protein that we can we even want to track by gene encoding process another question what is fret fret is mainly a energy transfer process between two fluorophore or, uh, or chromophore or light active molecule it's uh, that uh, the, there is energy transfer between two fluorophore and this energy transfer is inversely Inversely proportional to their distance of two fluorophore. Another question is: It non-invasive? The, it has it, yes, it is non-invasive process to use GFP, and non-invasive means it it is not it does not involves instruments into the body. Without using instruments in the body, we can in we use green fluorescent protein to in the we use green fluorescent proteins. and it is non invasive process to detect the cells and in biological system cells are put. any other question uh, just i am asking one thing uh, to excite to observe the fluorescence what is the exciting source is it in visible region or in uv region it is uh, it is visible to uv region at the blue light blue light to uv visible region uv visible that is in the more near to visible so, so that there is no harm in the skin yes sir okay so thank you rahul for your nice presentation now next person so you will please tell 
Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Rahul, for such an effective presentation. Uh, for our next presentation, we have uh, Shoibal Mukherjee, MSc Applied Chemistry, second year, Macau. So, Shoibal, over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Am I audible? Yes, you are. Thank you, Shomnath. Uh, thank you, sir. So, hello. And uh, just yes. a second. Just a second. I will yes. do the presentation in a minute. Is it visible? Uh, not yes, yet. Make uh, go to the PPT. Okay. Okay. Ah, yeah. Can you confirm if it, if it, it is changing? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, hello. Uh, good morning to all the teachers present over here. I'm Shoibal Mukherjee from a fourth sem Department of Applied Chemistry, Macau, West Bengal, and today I will talk about composite materials. So. Uh, what is composite material? So composite materials are basically made from two or more different component materials, and they become more stronger <clears throat> than those individual components when they come together. So what are these two materials and what is their role in here? So there are uh, two phases in a composite material. First one is the matrix or pri primary phase, and the second one is reinforcing agent or secondary phase. So this primary phase basically exists in a form of polymer resin, as a, uh, resin adhesives, ceramics, etc., and the secondary phase exists in two forms. One is particle of flake or powder, and the other form is thin or thick fiber, but having thread form. So composite can be both uh, synthetic and uh, natural as well. Uh, so next comes, uh, why would we use composite materials? What's special in there? Why it is re emerging rapidly in today's time? So we've already know uh, about the deforestation and its adverse effects. It's really scary, it's really scary, but at the same time, to fulfill the demand, fiber reinforced polymer matrix composite got considerable attention as a substitute due to its extraordinary strength properties. The superior advantages are comparatively low cost, uh, low, um, the, um, low cost, <coughs> low weight, uh, less damage to the processing equipment, high relative physical and mechanical properties, use of renewable sources, biodegradab biodegradability, and of course, the least health hazards. So as I said, uh, composites are integral part of our daily life. <clears throat> Composite prepared from high stiffness fiber reinforced uh, agents uh, with high acting resin systems are widely used in household as well as in the industrial application from a wide range of low cost to, ex to expensive purpose, uh, depending on the choice, of course. Also uh, in aerospace industry, all items for military, including lightweight thermal resistant composite housing for military shelter, uh, but there are so many in Arunachal Pradesh and uh, so many states in high altitude area in India. Also in sporting goods uh, like uh, tennis racket, baseball equipment, archery equipment, etc. Probably the table you are using to keep your PC right now is also an application of composite material. So what are the advantages? I mean, uh, there uh, have to be advantages. Uh, that's why we are using this in today's time. Uh, composites have a higher specific strength than many other materials. Mainly its advantage is many com com combination of matrix and reinforcement agents. It's tough, it's durable and lightweight, of course. And of course, it's super strength is the specialty, main specialty, if I say. Also, it is water resistant, easily transportable due to its lightweight, of course. They're cost effective, depending on the choice, again. So... Uh, but composites are brilliant. Composites are brilliant. There is no doubt. But there is also some limitations. Like they have raw material sometimes, uh, expensive raw materials. In uh, is that is another thing, and they cannot be uh, recycled easily. And the main thing is the specialized uh, manufacturing process. I mean the expertise. Uh, there should be expertise when we are using. So uh, they may have a very. Uh, they may have some long term health problem for those who work on a daily basis with these materials, sometimes their disposal may be difficult and cost can fluctuate. Again, that depends on the choice, desired product actually. So yeah, there is there are limitations. So, uh, <clears throat> so uh, 
causes uh, basically it causes the less damage to the nature and potential future benefits was really prove amazing for the composite materials they are really flexible to the external challenges also in the change in the nature and one of the most important thing it is seen that they are viable substitute for conventional reinforced concrete frame in earth correct phone regions so here i conclude uh, my part and i uh, and i would like to thank the department of applied chemistry for giving me this opportunity and the organizing committee for all their efforts and this arrangement uh, that's all from my side thank you for your precious time thank you very much thank you soibal now question from yes sir uh, i think there is question in chat box uh, can you mention some can a composite be repaired can a composite be repaired? yes uh, they can be repaired but uh, that depends on the product actually but uh, i mean that is some uh, uh, limitation if i say that they cannot be repaired easily so yeah that is a limitation that is a back draw drawback i say if i say yeah another question can you mention some examples of composite yeah yeah of course of course uh, there are so many actually but there are natural and synthetic as well natural composites uh, like wood bamboo uh, where the cellulose part is the reinforcing agent and lignin is a matrix one and synthetic are so many so many as i said the pc table you are using right now is an application of uh, composite material carbon fiber as well mud bricks and etc and many more there are so many yeah and what is specific strength okay uh, the specific strength uh, is basically the strength to weight ratio like if you are using a material which is a high in weight and high is strength that is natural but here is the advantage is strength to weight ratio where the weight is light but strength is uh, super strength as i said so yeah that is the advantage of it okay now uh, so you all thank you for your presentation okay. thank you sir okay thank you thank you thanks to everyone yeah now next speaker yes sir uh, thank you shoibal for such an enlightening presentation that you have gave uh, for our next presentation we have ashmita sen from msc applied chemistry first year macau so over to you ashmita ashmita please start osmita make it uh, full slide yes, yes. sir can you visible yes. sir yes visible okay sir. thank you good morning everyone i'm so glad that you could join me today my name is ashmita sen student of msc in department of applied chemistry first year of maulana abdul kalam azad university of technology west bengal today i'm going to share some concept of ocean acidification and its impact so let's start ocean acidification is a change in ocean chemistry lowering of ocean ph that is increase in the concentration of hydrogen ion driven by the uptake of carbon compound by the ocean from the atmosphere oceans are an important reservoir of co2 absorbing a significant quantity of it one third produced by anthropogenic activities and effectively buffering climate change as the uptake of atmospheric co2 increases concentration of hydrogen ion in the ocean increases concentration of carbonate ion decreases and the ph of a ph of the ocean becomes less and the ocean becomes less alkaline this process is basically termed as ocean acidification next we come to the co2 effect on ocean acidification since the industrial revolution the global average ph of the surface ocean has decreased to uh, 0.11 which is corresponds to approximately 30% increase in the hydrogen ion concentration now the ocean currently has a ph around 8 and is therefore basic and it is nearly impossible chemically for all of it to actually become a ph less than 7 then 
why do we refer to it as a ocean acidification this is because acidification is the direction of trend at the travel regardless of any starting point acidification refers to the lowering of ph from any starting point of the ph to the any end scale now what are the factors that affecting the ocean acidification acid rain produced from the emission of sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide which reacts with the water molecule to form nitric acid and sulfuric acid from the human activity though it has a very regional chain and not very globally second is we have eutrophication as we can see from the picture that it is characterized by a significant increase of algae due to greater availability of sunlight co2 and nutrients when the plankton blooms collapse as we can see from the picture that uh, uh, when it collapses and sink to the sea bed the subsequent respiration of the bacteria decomposing the algae leads to decrease in the sea water oxygen and increase in the co2 now let's know the chemistry behind the process the term ocean acidification uh, summarizes several process that occur when co2 reacts with the sea water here two reactions are important firstly the formation of carbonic acid with the release of h plus ion when atmospheric co2 dissolves in the sea water to produce aqueous co2 it also form carbonic acid which rapidly dissociates to produce bicarbonate ion in turn bicarbonate ion can also dissociate into subsequent carbonate ion both of these reaction produces proton and therefore lower the ph ph of the solution several biological processes that are being affected by the lowering of ph that we will be learn about in the next few slides calcification sea water absorbs co2 to produce carbonic acid bicarbonate and carbonate ion the carbonate ion being produced are essential for calcification that allow certain organism to build their calcium carbonate cells and skeleton however increase in the atmospheric co2 level leads in increase in bicarbonate ions level causing a decrease in the concentration of carbonate ion and thus uh, the calcification is harder to achieve but we have a winner here that it is predict, uh, that ocean acidification is predicted to enhance the photosynthetic kinetic in many uh, marine taxa due to the increase in sea water co2 and the lowering of ph which helps to stimulate the plant growth destruction of food web obviously occurs as everyone rely on one another the extraction of one species may affect the entire she will slip now what can marine organism do to survive this they have to they have to tolerate to acclimatization they may adapt the climate or move to the non acidified water bodies and if such ocean acidification continues for years we have total extinction total extinction is the only possibility if ocean acidification continue for next few years now we will learn about what is saturation horizon deep waters are under saturated with carbonate ion causing a shelf of most calcifying organism to dissolve surface water are over saturated with carbonate ion and do not readily dissolve as the ph of the ocean fails it results in salving of the lysine and the ccd thus exposing more of the cells trapped in the sediments to an under saturated condition causing them to dissolve now combating acidification requires reduction of co2 and improving health of the ocean creating marine protected areas and stopping destructive fishing activities addition of alkali such as limestone carbonate material to the system and many more finally we come to the concluded point that what have, that what have been done from the above discussion that oceans are need to be saved and not for Uh, the ocean acidification process to continue for years it is our ocean and we are the one to save them so this is my reference and acknowledgement that i would like to th thank my entire teachers and friends for guiding with the process throughout thank you so much so thank you osmita for nice presentation
Now, Thank you, sir. Open, for, open for questions. Uh, anyone? Yeah, I think in the question answer, there is one. Is only CO2 responsible for ocean acidification if other mentioned? Yeah, atmospheric CO2 that the ocean absorbs and uh, that turns it into aqueous CO2 is only responsible for ocean acidification because it produces uh, bicarbonate ions and carbonate ions which are really harmful as it lowers the pH of the ocean and hence acidification occurs in the global level. Okay, another one is does acidification cause coral bleaching? Yes, of course, because the drop in seawater pH as the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide from the emission of greenhouse gases reduces the availability of calcium minerals for skeleton building and repair and makes it harder for the corals to build their skeleton because, uh, you know, uh, calcification does not occur. That's why coral bleaching occurs. Many organisms mm -hmm. face coral bleaching. Okay. Another one is here that uh, what does it mean for the fisheries and how it affects them? Because they are not able to tolerate that, tolerate it. And if they have to tolerate, the acclimatization is the only process that it could, uh, it could uh, you know, adapt to tolerate the effect that is that it has been uh, proceeding in the ocean. It is a process in which an individual organism adjusts to a change in its environment, allowing it to maintain fitness across the change of environmental conditions. Okay. Sir, um, I have a question. Yes. Yeah, uh, just uh, there is another one. Then, uh, Shomnati, it's, it will be your turn. Yes. How do we know what will happen and won't? There will be both winners and losers. Is it question? From... Is it from Shomnath? No, sir, it's not mine. Do you know that what will happen? Yes, should, that? Uh, should I answer, sir? Hello. So, if you can. Yes, although there are many winners, but scientifically research tells us that there will be so far, uh, there will be more losers because the organism responses to it are overwhelmingly negative, harming growth and reproduction classification as I already discussed, of course, and survival. So as we can see from the overall process that losers are more oh. instead of winners. Okay. Shomnath, your turn. Uh, won't you, sea, uh, uh, my question is, won't sea life oh. adapt since the oceans were more acidic in the past? What are your thoughts on that? No, because it, it solely depends on the human being how we are you know contributing to our nature because if we uh, you know reduce using uh, uh, emission of uh, greenhouse gases then definitely because ocean has its buffering capacity ocean can you know uh, take part in uh, like uh, acidification can't be you know uh, what to say acidification can't occur if ocean has a large buffering capacity because because we are the one that needs to take part in the acidification process, because if we reduce using uh, greenhouse gases, if we uh, reduce uh, you know emission of you know carbon dioxide, then obviously ocean could buff uh, increase its buffering capacity. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ashmita. Yeah. Dishan, uh, now next speaker, please, Somna. Yes, sir. Um, thank you, Ashmita, for such a beautiful presentation. Uh, for our next presentation, we have. Um, uh, Shahanur Mojumdar from MSc Applied Chemistry Second Year, Macau. So over to you, Shahanur. Yes. So I am sharing the screen. Yes. Sir, is, is it is it will be visible? Yeah, is it? It is now. So just make it in the slideshow motion or full screen, whatever. Sir, please confirm whether it changes or not, sir. Yeah, yeah it is okay yes. now. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon to all the respected teachers present over here. I am Shahanur Mojumdar from 4th Sem, Department of Applied Chemistry, Macau, West Bengal. Uh, and I am going to talk about synthesis of pyrimidine thioglycosides used in SARS-CoV-2. So, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, that is the SARS-CoV-2, the seventh human coronavirus 
was discovered in Wuhan, China during the recent epidemic of pneumonia in January 2020. Coronaviruses are a large family of viruses that commonly cause mild upper respiratory illness in people. The virus spreads similar to the flu by coughing, sneezing. The most common reported symptoms include fever, cough, shortness of breath, loss of taste, and smell. Gastro gastrointestinal symptoms such as vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain are described in 2 to 10 percent of the patients with COVID-19. So what are the antiviral drugs and how does it work? So antiviral drugs are one class of antimicrobials. It can ease symptoms and shorten the length of a viral infection. Antiviral medicines work differently depending on the uh, drug and virus type. Uh, and it can block receptors so virus cannot bind to and enter healthy cells. It can boost the immune system helping it fight off a viral inf infection. It's lower the viral load that is the amount of active virus in the body. So next one is the treatment against COVID-19. There are three types of uh, COVID-19 cases were found. There are mild COVID-19 cases, moderate COVID-19 cases, and the critical COVID-19 cases. Uh, for mild COVID-19 cases, patients should stay in bed according to the protocol by Professor Tingbo Lang, blood oxygen saturation monitoring and oxygen therapy with nasal cannula should be conducted regularly for these patients. For moderate COVID-19 cases, treatment principles include bed rest, supportive treatment to maintain energy supply, maintaining water and electrolyte balance and monitoring vital signs and oxygen saturations. For critical COVID-19 cases, the general treatment principles are active prevention and treatment of complications, prevention of secondary infections while treating basic diseases and organ function, support treatment in a timely manner. The drugs Remdesivir, Favipiravir, Cathepsinil have been permitted for use in the treatment of infections of coronaviruses. So now we come to the most important part of my talk, that is the synthesis of pyrimidine thioglycosides. It is a novel drug synthesis by LGME and is co -alars. The synthesis of our desired thiopyrimidine derivatives as if using mixture of two cyano 33 dimer to n aryl acryl amide and thioudia in absolute ethanol containing drops of piperidine to give thiopyrimidine derivative, that is the compound one. It is shown over here. And uh, the structures of compound one have been confirmed by using spectral and chemical measurements. The coupling between the compound one with the sugar marked by two, marked by two in presence of basic medium at room temperature to give pyrimidine is glycosides. That is the compound three. The compound three, uh, the structure of compound three were confirmed based on 13 CNMR, 1 HNMR, and IR spectroscopy. After that, thioglycosides, that is the compound three, were reacted with ammonia in methanol at room temperature for 10 minutes to give our desired thiopyrimidine derivative, that is the compound four. The structures of the compound four were confirmed. Uh, based on the spectral data and animal ele elemental analysis. So Three minutes left. The conclusion is uh, uh, the above method has been proven to be effective in preparing many analog components of nucleic acids. The method is also applicable in the field of industrial chemistry. With this method, some novel glycosides can be produced which show moderate anti sars cov 2 activity. These are the references of my presentation. And here I conclude my part. And I would like to thank the Department of Applied Chemistry for giving me their opportunity and my fellow classmates for their efforts and their arrangement. That's all from my side. Thank you. So, thank you, Sanur, for your presentation. 
now question any questions from anyone Shahanur. Yes, sir. What kind of organic molecules are better preferred uh, for treating this kind of SARS viruses? Is there any generalization of stru structure property relationship? Is there any established already? Yes, sir. Uh, it is established, but uh, it is. So you have uh, taken one only, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So there are many others uh, as well, yes, sir. which can be used. So, yes, sir. so is there any somehow it is directly linked with the structure and property like that or individually whenever it it's, uh, shows some property like uh, the heterocycle based compounds, of course. Sir, yes, sir. Uh, this is a heterocycle based compound and uh, Okay, Shanur. And if there is any other question from anybody else? Uh, okay, if not, then I think... Sir. Since there is no question, so yeah. uh, thank you, Shanur. Thank you. Now, yes. now, Somnath, please call next person. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Shanur, for such a beautiful presentation. Uh, for our next uh, participant, we have Ria Haldar from MSc Applied Chemistry First Year. Um, so, Ria, over to you. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm sharing my screen. Is it visible? Uh, yes, yes, visible. Not in slide mode. Make it preview. Yes, sir. Yes. yes. Is it now okay, sir? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Please start. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ria Haldar. I'm a first year student of applied chemistry in Maulana Abul Kalam Azad University of Technology. Today, my topic is anesthetics in surgery. So let's start. Yes. What are anesthetics? And means without and anesthesis means sensation. So anesthesia is a process applied to reduce pain and any other sensations. Anesthetics are drugs used to induce anesthesia. Anesthetics are generally uh, categorized into two classes according to their functions, general anesthetics and local anesthetics. Now, what are general anesthetics? General anesthetics are either gases or volatile liquids. These are inhaled with oxygen or administered intravenously. They produce a reversible loss of consciousness. For example, nitrous oxide, uh, influen, sevoflurane, isoflurane, etc. And what are local anesthetics? Local anesthetics are composed of esters and amides. They act by causing reversible block to sensation along nerve fibers of any part of the nervous system. Now let's see how do local anesthetics work. Local anesthetics combine with specific sodium ion channel sets on the nerve membrane and they can affect on the membrane potential by reducing sodium ion passage through the sodium ion channels and block the generation and conduction of nerve impulses. And how do general anesthetics work? General anesthetics change in mechanism of the release of neurotransmitters, thus cause a whole body anesthesia. Now let's have a look at some of such chemicals. At first, uh, nitrous oxide, it might be known to all of us 
that it is called as laughing gas. It is a general anesthetic. It is basically a colorless gas. It is uh, slightly metallic in smell and taste also. Its chemical formula is N2O. Here we can see the structure of nitrous oxide. It is inhaled during anesthesia. Okay, then N fluorine. It is also colorless. It's a volatile liquid. It has a sweet smell. It is uh, non-flammable and it is used as, as a general inhalation anesthetic. It is basically a halogenated ether uh, and its chemical formula is C3H2ClF5O and here we can see the structure. Then uh, semofluorine. It is a colorless liquid. It has sweet odor and it is non-flammable. We can see the structure. As its name shows, it has seven fluorine atoms. So it's semofluorine. Then isofluorine. It has a pungent, musty odor. It is actually a structural isomer of uh, influene. Here we can see the structure and can see the chemical formula also, uh, same as, same as influene. It is basically administered with oxygen as anesthetic. Then we go for benzocaine. It is used as a local anesthetic. It is white in color and used in crystalline powder. Here we can see the chemical structure of the molecule. Then lidocaine. It is also a local anesthetic and it is synthetic aminoethyl amide. Here we can see the structure. It is synthetic aminoethyl amide. Okay, here are some references I have used in this presentation. I'd like to thank all my respected professors for giving me this opportunity and I'm very much thankful to my friends also. I also thank the audience for listening to me. Thank you so much. So thank you, Ria, for your presentation. Now, questions from the participants. Uh, Ria, I am asking one question. That is, uh, this anesthetic, uh, after uh, some hours, it becomes inoperative. What is the reason? Can you please? Uh, uh, repeat, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, after applying, yes, sir. Uh, after some time, uh, it becomes again sense sense comes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I heard it. What is the reason? Uh, because, sir, uh, our uh, nervous system uh, again gets uh, its. Yes. Again the. Block again, uh, uh, again, resume actually. Yes, that means with time it, it decays. It, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, it loses the effect of anesthesia so that uh, it can uh, it can resume. Uh, 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 another question: Can local anesthesia be applied to the whole body rather than general anesthesia? Okay, it is an interesting question, sir. Uh, somebody the asking yeah, yes sir yes sir uh, uh, if you want a local anesthesia to be act as uh, general anesthetics um, you will have to apply it in the whole body right and yes. it is really painful and also it's very time taking uh, it can be done but time taking and painful is, yes sir and it also painful Yes. Another question. Who is general anesthesia is the first test? Omalindu Niyogi is asking. Uh, Sevofluorin, sir. Sevofluorin is the fastest uh, among the general anesthetics. Okay. So, thanks to Ria. For, oh, there is another question. Are inhaled anesthetics more effective or intravenous anesthetics? Sound sick the asking. Okay, uh, intravenous anesthetics are uh, more effective. More effective, yes. Um, as as uh, for inhaled anesthetics, 
uh, special equipments are needed and it is uh, expensive also then then intravenous is more effective okay so thanks to ria now somna yes sir next next uh, <clears throat> thank you ria for such a good presentation uh, for our next participant we have sreyoshi chakraborty msc applied chemistry first year uh, over to you sreyoshi yes am i audible yes yes you are audible you are audible okay sir <laughs> My screen is visible, no? Yes, visible, no, but not in full form, not in slide. Make it slide in slide two, yeah. slide mode. <coughs> yes, continue. Uh, good morning to all. Myself, Sreyoshi Chakraborty, <clears throat> the student of first year MSc in Applied Chemistry in Macau, is going to present a PPT on ionic liquid as solvent. Uh, here is the content. <clears throat> now, the era of ionic liquid. Ionic liquid was first reported by Gabriel and Winner. First <clears throat> discovered ionic liquid was ethyl ammonium nitrate. That was discovered by Paul Walden in 1940. Now, this is the recent progress report of ionic liquid year by year. Um, now, what is ionic liquid? Ionic liquid is a salt in liquid state having the melting point close or below to room temperature. Um, it, uh, its melting point will be lower than 30 degrees centigrade. <clears throat> ionic liquid is made up of the equal number of uh, cations and anions. That's why the entire system of ionic liquid is neutral. <clears throat> Now, there are some properties of ionic liquids. First is freezing point, means ionic liquid freezes below 100 degrees centigrade. Second is liquidus range. What is liquidus range? Liquidus range is uh, the temperature range up to which the ionic liquids are in liquid form. In case of ionic liquid, the liquidus range is greater than 200 degrees centigrade. Um, then thermal stability of ionic liquid is very high. Uh, and after that, specific conduct polarity is moderate. And specific conductivity, which is the measure of the ability of the uh, material or any ionic liquid to conduct the electricity. Hence, ionic liquid conduct electricity. The specific conductivity of ionic liquid is less, uh, less than 10 cement centimeter inverse. Now, why are ionic liquids are called liquids? In case of traditional salts or normal NaCl salts, the sizes of the cations in a plus and anion Cl minus ions are almost same in size. That's why uh, they can efficiently pack to form the crystal lattice. But in case of ionic liquids, the cations are asymmetrically substituted with the different bulky group to weaken the ionic interaction. Hence, it prevents the uh, packing of the cation and anions into a crystal lattice. That's why ionic liquids are called liquids due to this weakened interaction. <clears throat> and this is a simulated model of the ionic liquid. Now, uh, we have to know how ionic liquid play a big role in green chemistry. Before that, we have to know what is green chemistry. Green chemistry is the design of chemical products and processes that reduce or eliminate um, the use or generation of the hazardous substances. It is also called the sustainable chemistry. Now, ionic liquid acts as a solvent in different reactions and prevents the wastage of the solvent. Ionic liquid can be reused after the reaction also. That's why it plays a big role in green chemistry. The miscibility gap of most ionic liquids with alkylated aromatics allows product isolation by simple decantation. Now we have to know what is simple decantation. Because simple decantation is the process of separation of immiscible liquids out of uh, the mixture of solid and liquid, such as suspension. Now this is the synthesis. Uh, ionic liquids, this is the ionic liquids. It has two steps. First step is quaternization step, and the second step is the metathesis reaction. Now, uh, the first step is a quaternization step where one methyl imidazonium <coughs> reacts with alkyl chloride 
uh, at 60 degrees centigrade temperature for 72 hours to form the white solid salt 1 methyl imidazonium chloride, BMIM cell. Um, now, this white solid salt is washed with dry and warm methyl acetate solution for several times until it will be completely free from the unreacted 1 methyl imidazonium. Now, the second step is the metathesis reaction. This reaction occurs using two reagents. First is HPFCs and the second is KPFCs. Uh, in the first case, 1-methyl imidazonium chloride reacts with HPF6 to form uh, BMIM PF6 minus, means 1-methyl imidazonium hexafluorophosphate. But in the second case, uh, using KPF6, uh, using KPF6, 1-methyl uh, imidazonium chloride reacts with KPF6 to form the same product, 1-methyl one, uh, one imidazonium hexafluorophosphate. And from this reaction, we, we, we can see that from the same reactant, we get the same product, but by using two different reagents. Now, here is the relative acylation reaction where pyridinium based ionic liquids are used as solvent. Here, the acidic anhydride reacts with the R alkylated benzene in presence of FeCl3, and pyridinium based ionic liquids like ETPY plus pf 6 minus or ETPY plus PF4 minus uh, to form the alkylated astrophenone. Here, the pyridinium based ionic liquids are used as solvent. There are some other examples where ionic liquids are used as solvent. In the first case, in enantiosylative hydrogenation, in enantiosylative hydrogenation of two phenyl acrylic acid, here two phenyl acrylic acid reacts with RHBNP hydrogen means two two dash this diphenyl phosphino one one dash vinyl to form two phenyl ethanoic acid in presence of ionic liquid. Here we here BMIM BF four acts as a solvent. In the second case, bromobenzene reacts with carbon monoxide and ROH in presence of palladium acetate and triphenyl phosphine. In presence of this ionic liquid, BMIM, BF4, the same ionic liquid, to form the, <coughs> the product are alkylated benzoic acid. Hence, in, in both homogeneously catalyzed reaction, we get uh, ionic liquid acts as a solvent. Now, applications, ionic liquids are used in different fields like biotechnology, chemistry, extraction, analytical techniques. Ionic liquid used as lubricants, fuel additives, um, in biocatalysis, organic reactions, thermal fluid, <coughs> fuel cell sensors, etc. Now, there are some references uh, of this PPT. Uh, now, acknowledgement, I'm thankful to all of my professors and uh, for guiding me in this project and also thankful to all of my classmates. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Sriyoshi, for your thank presentation. You. Now, open for <coughs> discussion. Question, any? Uh, one question, why do ionic liquid has low vapor pressure? Um, because the low vapor pressure are physically accessible uh, due to their low triple points and induced by their uh, lower melting point. That's why they have the low vapor pressure. Uh, why do ionic liquids, why ionic liquids are called designer solvent? <clears throat> uh, because the polarity, <clears throat> Uh, because the polarity, viscosity, and uh, physical chemical characteristics are determined uh, based on their cationic and anionic constituents. That's why they are called uh, uh, designer salt. Another <coughs> question What is liquidus range of ionic liquid? Uh, the ionic liquid's liquidus range is greater than 200 degrees centigrade, but uh, liquidus range is the temperature range up to which ionic liquids are uh, remain in the liquid form. Hence, the uh, temperature of the ionic liquid's liquidus range is greater than 200 degrees centigrade. Uh, any question more? <laughs> uh, so, one question, Sosi. Uh, is it environment friendly? Yes, sir, it is environment friendly because uh, in, in case of green chemistry, ionic liquid acts as a solvent because yes. in different reaction, ionic liquid uh, can be reused. That's why it is um, environmental friendly. Okay. Uh, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Sosi, for thank your you, nice sir. presentation. Uh, I think there is no more. Uh, Somnath, is there any other candidate? No, sir. Uh, so, thank you, Sosi, for your presentation. And I would like to thank all the participants here and our esteemed panelists. Um, we will go for a break no, for uh, we, we, two hours. That, yes, sir. Yes. Before that, I, uh, I shall say uh, something that all the presentations are very nice and all are of equally high standard. And it is very difficult to uh, judge from these presentations. 
which one is better, which one is best. <laughs> so very good, very nice presentation. Uh, the, the younger generations are very informative and thank you all for your nice, very good presentations. Thank you. Now, so yes. now, thank you, so sir. Much. Yeah, sir, I think uh, uh, so far, all the students of uh, second year and first year, they have pulled out uh, very nicely. And uh, we are back on time and uh, 10 minutes before the scheduled time. So I would like, as sir said, that, uh, uh, that the speakers and the coordinators, they deserve a big hand of applause uh, from our side, at least, and for having the job done so far. And uh, yeah, we have to decide somebody for getting uh, the awards. So it will be a pain for uh, me and sir, I think. But uh, it will be a good pain to have because so uh, everyone was uh, outstanding. And uh, especially to finish in time, that is something uh, very important. Yes. Th yes. That shows how, how prepared you are regarding your content delivery. So that is that was one section that all of our speakers have successfully performed. And also I would like to thank the couple of speakers from uh, other universities, from Sister Nivedita University and Calcutta University. They have uh, also presented very well and uh, interacted very well. There are several questions to interact with. They answered happily all the questions. So I'm thankful uh, that they have participated. And uh, from the Department of Applied Chemistry under the School of Applied Science and Technology of Macau, West Bengal, I wish them be best of luck for their future. And uh, I hope uh, they will do exceedingly well uh, in their career in future. And so, Shomnath, uh, if, when we join, you please announce them. Yes, um, thank you, everyone, for making this a success. Uh, we will... Uh, take a two hours break and we will meet shortly at 3 p.m. for the uh, second session where I'm going to give you a spoiler about that where we will see some exciting poster presentations there. So we will meet shortly at 3 p.m. So thank you all for making this same link. A su success. The same link. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is important. Yeah, the, that same the same link you have to join. And uh, there is no harm if you can join five minutes prior so we can uh, start the program sharp on three. And as we have been uh, instrumental in finishing in time, we want that in the second session as well. So uh, that will be appreciated. Komnath, right. please announce the name of chairpersons of the technical session two. Uh, yes. The chairperson for our technical session two will be Sir Dr. Orijit Bag and Dr. Devoshi Mannam. So yes. we will start sharply at 3.30.